So today, we're actually going to be completing um, our, let's say, our session, our journey through the feasts of the church. Um, we started all the way back, um, what was it now, 12, 13 weeks now, because um, I think we added, we had a couple of breaks in between. Um, but now we're finally finishing the great feasts of the church. And the last one is the Dormition of the Theotokos. Um, what we'll do, just as a side note, is starting next week, we'll actually be discussing the councils of the church, meaning what happened in the early church, right? So there's councils that warranted, that were warranted and needed to discuss where do we go from here. They're like pinpoints within history, starting from Acts 15, which pretty much is like the pre-council work, because the first council wasn't until the 300s, 325. So what did the church do for the first 325 years of its existence? You know what I mean? It's, a, it's a, gonna be a wonderful opportunity to look through history and see how the church has progressed and how we've even gotten to, not now it's not officially an ecumenical council, um, but the Council of Crete that just happened about a couple years ago, um, we'll be able to explore through that as well. So that's kind of what we're going to be moving forward. Um, but today we're going to conclude as we're going to discuss the Dormition of the Theotokos. So Dormition, the falling asleep um, of the Theotokos is a very important feast of our church. It even warrants its own fasting period. So one of the fasting periods that we have in the church, of course, we have Lent, we have the, which is 40 days, we have 40 days before Christmas, and then we have two other fasts. There's the one for the apostles, which is usually around in June, and then for the Theotokos, which is August 1st to the 14th, and the 15th being the, fifth, the feast day. It's a fixed feast day, which means it's gonna be August 15th, no matter what, year after year. So. There's no going to be surprise attack, there's no variable, there's, it's going to be the same every single year, which means August 1st, the only thing that you'll see that changes are actually the services that we have. So just like how when Lent happens and most fasting periods happen, there's let's say an increase in services. Now this one specifically has services for the Theotokos. There's the Paraklesis service, and then there's the great canon and the small canon of the Paraklesis. So now what are the differences? Mostly the structure is the same. However, the tones of what the hymns are chanted in are different. The ones that are, the ones that are in the great canon are in Plagal Fourth. They're a little happier in a sense. Um, the second ones are also very happy. They're very melodic and flowy, um, very beautiful. And they're from poems and from writings and prayers written um, from, the, from around, I believe, uh, what did I just read in an article? I believe it was somewhere around the 1200, 1300. So we didn't have these services, let's say, in the beginning of the church. We had them from around the 13th century. Um, so we have those services. And here we have the Paraclesi service every single day at St. Nicholas Cathedral from August 1st to the 14th. Um, other places, you'll see them on Wednesdays, Fridays, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, depending on, let's say, the, tr the local tradition of the church. Um, with that, the reason why you'll see the feast days with, let's say, the feast days of Christ is who is the Panaya, who is the Theotokos, right? She was the one who bore Christ, as we hear at Christmas, that Christ came to the world through her. So she obviously plays a huge role. Now her Domitian is a very large feast day, um, not just because it's one of the 12 that we have, but mostly even if you go in parts of Greece, you'll see churches that are dedicated to her, that are adorned with beautiful decorations and the villages and so on, and they celebrate and they celebrate and it takes days to celebrate the Panagia's Domitian. And when you think of someone who passes away, it's usually a sad time. But in this case, it was actually a very joyful time because the mother of God gets to be one with her son, with God. And so her body also ascended, so there wasn't like a burial. There was, as you see in the iconography, there was the Dormition icon of her sleeping. However, her body therefore ascends to be together, unified completely with her, in a sense, perfect soul, together with her son, whom is perfect, God. 
Um, so that's what is commemorated on this feast day and those services and the fasting times that we have. So that's why there's that fast, the 14 days. That's why there's the beefing up of the services. And that's why the feast day in of itself is such an important one because yes, she was the mother of God, but truthfully is a perfect example to the mother of us all. What is one thing that we all have in common here? We have a mother, right? We have a biological mother. That is the one thing we all have in common. We have a mother and a father, biologically speaking. But without our mothers, we couldn't come into the world. And with that, the word of God coming to the world in the flesh, the incarnation, as we call that feast day, which is Christmas, is such an important one. She plays such a role in the church and God's plan for salvation. What other way, in a sense, to celebrate any point of her life, for that matter? Um, you know, we, just yesterday we celebrated Ipapandi, the entrance of Christ into the temple. When we do 40-day blessings, we know we come into the church, and we already spoke about this, we come into the church, and the prayers are actually about the mother. But the entrance of Christ to the temple is a little bit different because it being Christ. It kind of gets, not to say lost in the side, because she's referenced within the hymnology, and it's a beautiful feast, and it's a beautiful tradition that we've kept even into our Orthodox faith, but it gives us the opportunity to really see the beauty of the church and the love and compassion that she had for her son, the Son of God, but also for all of us in the world, and it's a beautiful feast day. Are there any questions about this feast, let's say, particularly, or the feasts in general as we conclude? I'd like to think we did a pretty good job. Barring no questions. Any questions in general? All right, here we are. Well, where's my timekeeper? We've got like four minutes, 20 till. So we have five minutes. So I'm gonna talk for five minutes or I'm just gonna shut down the camera. What are we gonna do? I can talk. You love hearing me speak. All right, fine. Fine, fine, fine. The one thing I love about church history, and this is kind of going into um, our topics moving forward, is everyone kind of thinks we like make up rules, right? We make up traditions, not us, but other churches and other denominations. They think, well, why, why do they call themselves a true church? If you look all the way from the beginning, historically, these are pinpoints in time. Christ came to the world. We know Christ existed, right? We know Christ died. We know Christ resurrected. We know these things. There's, let's say, live witness accounts of these things happening. So these are historical pinpoints in time. And then within the early church and the establishment of our liturgies, the establishment of our, let's say, uh, patriarchates and so on, there's pinpoints in time that we're going to be able to witness through this next journey that we're gonna take of these councils. Right? So the, let's say people always say, what do the canons of the church say? What do the rules of the church say? Versus traditions with a small t. This will be able to actually explore that because in these councils, in these pinpoints in time, there's, I mean, there's obviously, there's that, I mean, plenty of canons, right? We're not gonna cover every single one and we're not gonna cover like what every single one says, but maybe we'll throw in, let's say like the highlights of them all. Um, but it's gonna give us an opportunity to see how the church has grown. Yes. Which hands? What are her hands doing? I mean, I've seen the icon before, but I don't necessarily know. I don't know. I said I have seen that icon before. I just don't. I would not be able to tell you right now off the cuff. Um, I have to do some research. I'll get back to you on that, though. It's a beautiful icon. And they cut their hands off. Look at that. We have the answer here. So, the, the Theotokos appeared to the person. No, the Theotokos, it's September 15th, which is in the Dormition. And he goes to. So, at the Dormition, he goes to, someone goes to mock her. And the angel. And the angel cuts the person's hands off out of him mocking her. That's what it was just explained to me. 
but I'll, again, I'll do some more research. If I don't ever know a question, I'll always be able to do the research and, and get back to you. So, God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.